Hello, everybody, and welcome to the live stream. As usual, I have the uh, worry about not being heard because we're trying to do a, a better, more professional setup now. We're using the proper camera, proper microphone. If you've watched past live streams, I've literally just done it to the uh, to the, to the computer. So if anybody uh, listening can confirm that they can hear me okay, I'd be very grateful. I see we already have Anthony McNabb, who's watching, and Rudy. How are you, Rudy? Certainly one of the longest term viewers and, and biggest supporters of the channel. Uh, Anthony says, hello from Julatan, North Queensland, Australia. And Rudy confirms that all's okay. So thanks very much. As you can see, we have an empty chair here. That's because Kristen Klein is still on her way in. The traffic in Fort Lauderdale is absolutely awful. And uh, we actually have our headquarters in the Lauderdale Marine Center, which has a huge car park but still very difficult to find a parking space. So I think Kristen will be with us in about 10 minutes. Uh, she's going to come straight in here and get into the live stream. And she's an interesting person to talk to on a number of levels. First of all, she's a relatively new yacht broker. So it's interesting to talk to somebody who's in the early stages of their career. She's certainly a very successful yacht broker. And um, sorry, I'll just get, do you mind just turn them to keep it down? Thanks. And um, the fact that she's a female is interesting because 99% of sales brokers are male. She's a female working in a male environment. So I'm looking forward to talking to her about that. And certainly you'll, um, you'll have your questions for her as well. What I thought I'd do while we're waiting for her to arrive is uh, just tell you some of the up and coming things for the channel because we've got some interesting projects on the go. Um, today in London, I have a marine lawyer recording answers to questions from the vlog that I made about the uh, invasion in Ukraine. There was a lot of very good questions uh, on that. I was, I was not sure really whether to publish that video, to be honest, because the whole point of the Yachts for Sale and Charter YouTube channel is to promote great things about yachting. It's a very positive channel uh, with a positive message. But the uh, war in Ukraine has had such a, a significance to the yachting industry, it was important to, to at least mention it and not just pretend that it's not happening. That triggered off quite a few really good legal questions. And I sent off the questions to James Jaffa of Jaffa & Co, who's uh, not only a very, very successful uh, marine lawyer, but also a very good friend of mine. And he's recording the answers to those questions today. So hopefully early next week, I'll be able to publish that video and it will be an interesting subject about the legal implications of what's happening with these Russian yachts being seized. Also, it came to my attention through YouTube that it's the 10th anniversary of this YouTube channel. I had a little message on the what's called the dashboard of the channel. Um, and I thought, wow, that's a great opportunity to just recap the last 10 years where the channel's gone from very small beginnings to where it is today, and also some exciting things in the future that are happening. Um, actually, you'll be surprised when I show you the first video that I ever filmed of a yacht walkthrough. Um, it's maybe not what you're expecting to see, and it's a, an old video that I've dug out and I'm gonna show in that vlog. Um, I'll also be mentioning in that sort of future uh, projects, I'm looking forward to returning to Monaco in a couple of weeks' time. And when I get back, I'm presenting the Monaco Ocean Week Symposium at the Monaco Yacht Club. That's a really interesting event. And that whole event, which is a one-day symposium, will be live streamed, not on this channel, but I'll be sending you a link to where you can watch the live stream. And it's really a very clever initiative because more and more yachts are traveling further and further afield, some even going to Antarctica. And the point that the Monaco Yacht Club wants to make is it's a bit of a waste having these yachts going to these places if they can't pool the data that they're able to gather while they're there. Now, I was struggling to think what sort of data could possibly be useful, but actually there are specialists in the environment, specialists in explorer yachts, okay. specialists in sustainability in the yachting industry, and they're all there to give their input into... Um, how yachts can be used to help the environment rather than to damage the environment. Anyway, that's a future um, event. That's on March the 24th. So I'll be sending you details of that close to the date. That said, Kristen has arrived. Kristen Hi. Klein is in the building. Hello. Sorry, I'm a few minutes late. There's rain and a slow brigade down 995. <laughs> no problem at all. Can everybody hear Kristen okay? I'll just uh, wait for some 
feedback because there's like a, a couple of seconds delay between the live stream. Okay. Um, somebody says they're surprised I'm not at the Dubai Boat Show. Have you ever been to the Dubai Boat Show? I have not been to the Dubai Boat Show yet. Not yet. It's a nice show to go to for the experience, but it's not a show personally I'd go to every year. Yeah. It's a long way to go. It's a long way to go. And, you know, we don't have a lot of, you know, for a lot of new listings over there. So, no. But it would be great to go and eventually. Right. So let's 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 get down to it. As they say on YouTube, <laughs> you are um, a successful yacht broker. Uh, how did you get into the industry, first of all? Uh, well, if the, that's a great question. I first got into the industry about 15 years ago. I worked on boats. Uh, I ended up down in St. Martin with my family once for a spring break and you know, my sister and I had always wanted to travel and we saw all, all these beautiful yachts and thought, wow, what a great way to travel and see the world. And that's what we did for six years. What sort of sized yachts were you working on? I worked on a couple, a large, I worked on probably 175, 180 foot. And then I kind of went down to smaller vessels, 112 feet. Um, I always liked being a solo stewardess and kind of doing a little bit of everything and you know, always moving and making the decisions. So, so I guess you had to get your STCW license for that. Was yeah. Yep. So right after I graduated from college, I, I jumped on a train from Tampa, Florida. You know, went into a crew house and got my STCW in within a week, and I had my first job uh, that Friday. Wow. So I had just done fire school and you know hot and sweaty and. Went out for to meet a captain and got my first job. Great. I did a, a series of videos called Breaking Into Brokerage for people who want to become a yacht broker and they don't know how to go about it. And the first thing I say is get yourself somewhere where there's lots of yachts. Mm -hmm. You're not going to become a yacht broker in Detroit. Yeah? <laughs> so in your case, you moved to Fort Lauderdale. Uh, and, and my second piece of advice in that series is actually then get a job doing something in the industry mm -hmm. so you start to make your contacts. So you did that. Yep. And then at what point did you go from a sea-based job to a land-based job? What happened there? Um, so, well, so I had always kind of made a, a commitment to myself that I, was gonna, you know, I wasn't going to be a full-time crew member my whole life. I, I always said I would go back to school by the time I was 30. Uh, so when I was 28, an opportunity came about here at Northrop & Johnson, and uh, I was the receptionist. It was you know, a position. I was ready to go back to shore. I loved everybody at Northrop and Johnson. I knew Kevin Merrigan. I knew Amy Walkman. And I thought, what a great place to work. So I took that, I took that position and you know, went started working at Northrop and I went back to school and I started my master's program a week before I turned 30. So oh, really? So I did it. <laughs> and, and your master's in, in what? I have my master's in business administration. Yep. An MBA from uh, University of Florida. Go Gators. Excellent. And so then from receptionist, one day Kevin invited you yep. to, to work more closely with him, really, wasn't it? Yep. So I had already kind of been working with Kevin. His office was right next to the reception desk. And, you know, we kind of had a, you know, we, we got along well. We have similar personalities. And, you know, one day he gave me the opportunity to, to become his assistant. And I, of course, accepted it. So I moved into the office next to him and... And for a couple of years there, I was his, you know, right hand man in yeah. helping him with deals and the company. And I loved it. It was a great experience. And I still love it. I still. How involved do you get on deals? Is, was, was Kevin keeping sort of um, the, the contract confidential, the, the, the prices that he was getting? Was that all confidential or did you have open access to all of that information? Yeah, I mean, it was open access. So I, I received his inbox was my inbox. So for that time, I, you know, every email and every deal, I was right there helping him and, you know, learning and understanding how the, you know, the brokerage side worked, how contracts worked, you know, how he communicated with his clients, everything. So I, it was a great experience. And if anybody wants to get into brokerage, I highly recommend, oh, yeah. you know, becoming an assistant first and just learning in, and maybe you want to go do something different in the industry, you know, charter. Yeah. I stayed in sales because I just always... I love the rush and I love the, you know, it's, it's a little bit of everything and it was just something that I stuck with and I enjoyed it. 
So now uh, there's some questions from from viewers that I'll I'll put to you in a moment, but I've got one last question myself for you because you you've been working with charter brokers and with Kevin's a sales broker, but he owned the company, so he was involved with charter things going on as well. Yeah. Typically. Um, women gravitate towards the charter side of our business and become charter brokers or charter managers. Men typically gravitate towards the sales side. Why do you think that is? That's also a great question. I, I don't... They're the only sort I ask. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, I, God, I wish... That's water there if you want it. Oh, thanks. I wish there were more female sales brokers. I, I honestly never thought about it as women do charter and men do sales. I... I just never looked at it like that. I thought, well, if this guy can sell a boat, I can sell a boat. <laughs> Honest, honestly, I thought, you know, I'm smart. I can do this. I know enough. And I'm, you know, every day you learn something new, but there's nothing to stop a woman from doing sales. Yeah. Um, you know, I like charter. I worked on charter boats. I, I think they're it's fun. You know, charter shows are great, but, you know, I like sales. So I, I just always stuck with sales. Well, Rudy Degelt, who's a long-time viewer of the channel, he says, do you think that a woman has more difficulties becoming a broker, or is it simply the fact that this kind of profession is less known by women? Um, I, I would say that for me, working at Northrop & Johnson, I was very lucky that Kevin, that Daniel, they supported me 100%. When I, when I approached them about becoming a broker, it was kind of like, of course, you know, yeah. I think you would be great in that role. You can do it. I, I think females kind of see that there are more men and they think, oh, I'll just go do the charter side. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. But, you know, there's nothing to stop a woman from becoming a sales broker. Do you get any kickback from uh, clients who are a bit? I mean, yes, of course, that does. You know, some some owners and clients are, you know, particular about what they're looking for. Um, but I think it's an advantage. I yeah. find it very advantageous to talk to clients and, you know, they, once they meet me and understand my background and just get to work with me a little bit, they acknowledge that I know what I'm talking about and that I'm, you know, going to serve them in a way that will work for both parties. Yeah. So in a sense, it's a similar thing to, um, I've known a couple of yacht brokers who are extremely young looking like they're close to 40, but they look like they could be in their 20s. And sometimes they've said to me, that's a problem because the client thinks, oh, you're too young to sell my boats. Uh, so there's a lot of prejudices for all sorts of Are you saying I look there. young, David? You look very young. <laughs> <laughs> You've got a double whammy because you're young and female. I'm 38. So <laughs> I'll be 39 this year. <laughs> so um, what was I going to ask you as well about on that subject of uh, kickbacks from clients? Um, who may be, what about uh, shipyards? Because um, we all know certain countries of the world that have many, many yacht builders are maybe a little bit more backwards on the whole. Um, I've been to shipyards in, here in the US. I've been to you know, uh, the Netherlands. I've been to Italy. I never saw any sort of you know, prejudice or anything like that. I, I, I loved all the shipyards. I think they you know, definitely accommodated and were great. I enjoyed it. <laughs> Good. What was the first boat that you sold? The first boat I sold was called Serenity 2. It was a 90, it is a 95 foot Admiral Marine. It's, it's now called Edison. Um, and that was, you know, my first deal, my first client. And he, I love the client. He's a great guy. And I, you know, appreciate his business and that he came back to me to sell his boat. So the boat is for sale today. Yes. It's, you've got it back for sale again. And I did the yep. video of, of Edison. Yep. As well. And I met the owner at, um, was he at the Monaco show? Yep. He's usually at yeah. Monaco and Flugs. We're getting quite a few comments, not so many questions. Anthony McNabb says, real estate is another industry that's seeing strong growth in the number of ladies making big strides. It's great to see. Actually, when I've, I've been coming to the States for years, and there's a lot of female real estate agents here. Mm -hmm. You see them advertising everywhere. Um Anthony McNabb says, I love your can-do attitude. I see you doing great things in your career. Thank you. Rudy Degelt, here's a question for you. Oh, gosh. I don't know if you can answer this question, is what he says. Okay, we'll see. But does the geopolitical situation have a big influence on your job right now? Hmm. Right now, I would say that 
a business is normal. I would say that I'm I'm been doing deals right now. I'm have showings right now. It hasn't influenced it a lot. Uh, you know, fingers crossed. Yeah. So we'll see. Time will tell. I think actually, Northrop and Johnson, we don't have a lot of Russian clients. I, yeah, but I'm sure over in Europe. Um, yeah. But you know, for me, luckily, nothing has changed. It's business yeah. as usual. You know, the price of fuel right now hasn't impacted a lot of buyers, at least right yeah. now that I'm working with. It hasn't even been brought up. So yeah, um, yeah. So so far, so there's your answer, Rudy. So far, it's business as, as normal. Um, Dylan. I think that's a zero, Dylan Zero says, what's the best thing clients can do to make your life easier as a yacht broker? <laughs> to make my life easier, um, you know, just be transparent, you know, respond and, you know, have a, if, if there needs to be a tough discussion, then we have that discussion. Yeah. You know, if we're going to, if we have to, if we're going to make a plan to sell your boat or to buy a boat, we need to follow that plan and, you know, if things need to change or, you know, we need to do something different, we need to make those tough calls yeah. and do that. Can you give me an example of a tough conversation in the process of a, of a deal? Um, so, you know, oftentimes, you know, when we have listings for sale, you know, if the boat's been on the market for quite some time and that's going to be, you know, dependent on the party, you know, some a one seller might say, look, I, I want to sell my boat. I'm not terribly committed right now to selling it. You know, a year later, you know, if they become more motivated, you say, look, you know, we've had the boat on the market for this amount of time. We haven't had a lot of activity that would indicate that, you know, a sale is near. Yeah. You know, if we have to drop the price or just, you know, change a location, do something, yeah. you know, then we have to do that. And, you know, those are some sellers, you know, want to stay, you know, just keep the course. Yeah. And others will, you know, have to make those decisions. Yeah, I, I think generally for yachts not selling and it's been on the market a long time. Often price is the is the issue, isn't it? It is. You know, that's a huge part of it. You know, availability, location. Yeah. You know, if you're cruising in the Caribbean for, you know, nine months out of the year and then you wonder why you don't have any showings or offers, yeah. you know, it's it's a challenge. Yeah. That's the thing. If somebody um, comes to Fort Lauderdale to look at a listing that you've got, while they're here, they can look at another six, seven, ten boats. Yeah. But if it's in... The back of beyond, I know, in Antigua, it's unlikely that there'll be yeah. yachts, that sort of selection of yachts in the same price and size range. Yeah. So loads more comments coming in. I'd mentioned earlier that I've got um, an interview. Do you, do you know James Jaffer, the, the lawyer? Mm -mm. He's a, a, a lawyer who's um, going to answer some questions about the legal implications of the war in Ukraine. Okay. And I just mentioned that he's a good lawyer in England. And T. Christian says, are there good lawyers in England? Yes, there are, T. Christian. <laughs> Plenty of good lawyers. Tommy Slater. Hi, Kristen. Do you think a master... Oh, this is a great question. Do you think a master degree, including a yachting track, like the one in Monaco or in La Rochelle, for example, would increase your chances to find a job in the yachting industry? Um, sure. I'm sure having that background and that education will definitely, you know, help get a job. Um, you know, for me getting my master's degree, I never really thought I would end up in sales. I kind of just happened to fall into it when I graduated. But, you know, for me, it was great because it allowed me to really understand, you know, our clients who are often business owners and leaders and, you know, having the ability to really communicate with them well, understand, Everybody is different and you have to manage personalities. That's a, it helps, you know, to have that background. And I think, sure, and it, tracking that would be definitely helpful. How, how long did it take you to get your master's? Mine was, I think it was about two and a half years. So yeah. but it was, I worked full time and it was, it was a part time program. So it was every third weekend. It was all weekend. So eight hours Saturday, eight hours Sunday. Yeah, well, I think it shows level of commitment as well, doesn't it? If there, if there is a master's degree in the yachting industry and somebody's done it, then you know that they're really focused on, um, on working in the industry. Yeah. Um, Super Yacht Captain's here. Hi, Tristan. He's uh, tuned in as well. Tristan, I think you've got a live stream tomorrow. So if you want to put a comment in the, um, in the comment section, I'll just let everybody know the details of that. Um, Tommy Slader, we've answered your question. Anthony McNabb. Has the fuel situation seen an increase in inquiry? Oh, this is a good question as well. 
has the fuel situation seen an increase in the inquiries for electrical powered vessels? Uh, I have not seen any increase in that. We do get those inquiries often, or yeah. I would say at least two a year. I haven't seen any lately though. No. So not yet. I think the interest in electrical vessels may be fueled by, excuse the pun, might be fueled as well by the attention towards the environment and sustainability mm -hmm. um, more than the fuel prices going up. That's my, my take yeah. on that. Um, Dylan Zero, who you'd answered earlier about how a, a client can make your life as a broker easier. And he says, transparency definitely needed. I see. I've got another fun question. I'm taking a risk here because I'm reading your question as I see it. <laughs> without without uh, censoring it first. What's the weirdest, funniest reason? Oh, yeah. What's the weirdest, funniest reason someone wanted to sell or buy a yacht? Oh, gosh. I actually do have an answer for this. You do? Uh, well, I worked with some client or a few clients and they, you know, they have seen below deck <laughs> and they, you know, they saw it and they, you know, met a crew member on the dock outside the boat. And it was just, they, they saw the boat, they met the crew member. They thought it was, you know, higher powers putting them together and they, yeah. they bought the boat. Oh, they bought it. Really? Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> um, great clients, great people. Yeah, good. Very fun. <laughs> T. Christian asks what you think about the yacht artifacts. That's, is that an Abba King and Rasmus or is that? I a, think it's a Nobis group. It's a Nobis group, isn't it? Yeah, yeah I, I haven't been aboard. I've seen it. I think it's a very different, unique boat. I think it's, you know, it's a, sp a spectacular vessel. I, you know, I would love to see it one day and look forward to it. Yeah. I think it was at the Monaco show. It was in Monaco. Year. Yep. But I didn't get to go on board. I wasn't, yeah, I was working with one of our, um, colleagues in uh, Newport. I was covering okay. one of his boats, so I was kind of tied to that one. So. That's right, you weren't at Monaco last year, were you? I was, I was on um, Jatana, the Fed show. Oh, right, that's right. Yeah. Um, Shane Faber says, good day. What is your view on the yachting industry in South Africa? That's a great question. I would say, you know, don't, but the first thing that comes to my mind when the word South Africa is brought up is crew members. You know, I think we have a large amount of crew members here in the States and then in Europe looking for work on boats and that do work on boats. Um, I have crews in South Africa, but I would not be familiar enough with you know, yachts going there. You've cruised in South Africa. I, I cruised on a on a cruise ship. I was there. I yeah. when I was in college, I did a program called Semester at Sea, yeah. and we took a ship literally around the world. So we stopped in Cape Town for about a week. Oh, fantastic! So I've, I've been there, but I haven't. I would say, you know, maybe with you know people looking for more ad adventure on their boats, you know, maybe we'll see more owners taking their boats to South Africa. Which yeah. would be exciting. So yeah, there's certainly a lot of crew, a lot of South African crew. Yeah, um, all over the place in the Med and in, in yeah. the States as well. Yeah, um, and still with showing favour, he asks, and I'm sure a lot of people want to talk about this. But uh, what's your view on what's happening with Russian yachts at the moment? Um, I mean, it's I read about it this morning. A couple more, I think it was Robin Roman Abram. How do you say that? Yeah, he's just Abramovich? been um, sanctioned. Yeah. Yes, he's just been sanctioned. I mean. Whatever we, I don't want to get political, but you know, whatever we can do to, you know, help the people of Ukraine right now, I think we should, you know, look to those avenues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 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 a difficult topic to really talk about as well because Northrop and Johnson is such um has such deep roots in the United States, and we have a big presence in the Med. It's true, but the vast majority of clients for us are, are American yeah. clients, and so. I think as a company, we're probably not going to be as impacted as some other yeah. brokerages whose core business is with, yeah. with Russian clients. That's so going to be a difficult time for them. Yeah. Um, Dylan Zero asks me a question. Am I going to cover Namaste, the Bearing 65, which is for sale with Northrop and John? I've got to be honest, I'm not aware of that yacht. So I'll look into it. And if we have it, I'll try to do a video of it. Okay. Um, his this is an almost impossible name to pronounce. His ex Lency seems the current market is bringing lots of lots of sellers out of the woodwork. How does the inventory look like moving into this post pandemic phase? Cheers from DC. How does it look like post pandemic? I
I, I, I wish I had a crystal ball. <laughs> I, I don't know what it will look like. I think, you know, when I think about the it has done for our industry and, you know, people that were kind of dragging their feet or weren't sure they wanted to get into yachting, Post pandemic, I don't know what it will look like if people decide, you know, once their boat goes into the shipyard, they might not want to hold on to it. And, you know, those costs keep, you know, climbing. Um, but we'll, we'll find out. I think some people will definitely turn into sellers and some people will hold on to their boats. And, you know, they've discovered a new way of enjoying their lives and continue doing it. Yeah. So. And, and the inventory at the moment, I mean, let's say you've got a seller a buyer rather approaches you're looking to get into yachting is there a big selection of brokerage yachts available for sale or what, what's the situation it is it is somewhat limited right now yes um there are still great boats to be purchased you know inventory is down but if you know a, a good broker will shop off market as well so you know we know boats that are you know quietly for sale and that you know deals can still happen it's you know, what, what you see on MLS, there's always going to be more opportunities. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, Ralph Crawford, I think he's addressing this question to me because he wants to know about wider yachts, which is the update on wider yachts. But before I answer that, I'll give you the opportunity. Are you very familiar with wider? For which one? Wider. Wider. Are you familiar with wider? Are they, are they still building boats? They're in Italy? Your response tells the viewers everything they need to know. <laughs> <laughs> are they still building boats? So, Ralph, here's the thing. Um, I would love to do a video about wider yachts because I did um, actually this, this. My YouTube channel was built partly on the success of the videos that I did following the construction of the wider 150, the mm -hmm. 165, the diesel electric technology. The company got sold, and first of all, the the new owners announced that they were going to take it to the market before mm -hmm. they'd even built a boat, which I thought was odd. Then they announced they got a revolutionary new technology, which was zero emission and nobody mm -hmm. had seen before. And the only way anybody could use it is if they bought it off of them. And then that never happened. Then they announced that they're building a big new shipyard in a place called Farnham. And I don't really know too much about that. Then last week they announced they're building catamarans. Huh? And I, I, from time to time, I get in contact with them and ask them for information or they just don't answer. So. The reason that I've gone quiet and wider is because if I don't get an answer for them, it's difficult to sort of give you any reliable information. I suppose watch this space really and see yeah. what we do. I think I was on the wider in Monaco a couple right when it was yeah. launched, it, and it was an exciting boat to be on. It was had good vibes, and you know yeah. the you know chatter on the docks was great. Yeah. I thought everybody, yeah, I, I was excited to see what else they came out with, and then yeah, you know, well they, they were as well the first people really to have that. Open transom that yeah. completely opened up and you could sail your, yeah. your tender inside it became a uh, swimming pool yeah. and it was a great boat but for some reason the new owners are building catamarans instead so more questions coming in braveheart tudor says kristen what is the biggest yacht you've sold to date Ooh, uh gosh i, I should know this answer <laughs> i think well, I was involved with the Zoom deal, the Trinity, uh, Zoom, Zoom, Zoom. She was 161 feet. Uh, we just sold that a, a couple months ago. Um, 161 feet. Oh, that's a good size, yes. Yep. Yeah. And then we, I, before that, I did a one, I think she was 153 feet. It was the old uh, Argyle. It was a, a custom boat, and that was probably one of my first bigger deals. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think it was Argyle. Zoom, just, zoom. I've just had somebody saying audio is breaking up. Oh. But actually, not for everybody because, oh no, Rudy as well says he's got the same trouble. Is that just on Kristen's or on mine as well? Because it might be if your hair goes on the. No, it should be just the internet. Okay. Yeah, it's probably just the internet connection. Max is telling me, and I believe what he says because he knows what he's talking about. Um, still with Braveheart Tudor, he asked the question if you uh, say, selling a 90 meter yachts. Do you feel comfortable going to other brokers to ask for advice on, on really bigger sales? Sure, I, I work, I think a, a huge part of my success has been working on a team. You know, I think bringing more brokers into it, you know, you know, having a partner is great. And, you know, at Northrop and Johnson, we, I would say more, our team is pretty collaborative and, you know, you can chat with everybody and sure, I think yeah. it's, yeah. And it doesn't always follow that, you need the advice because the yacht's larger. No. Would you agree? 
yeah, I would just say, you know, discussing it in any way is helpful. You know, I, I wouldn't be intimidated by it or anything. It's, you know, just, it's just a bigger boat. Yeah. I mean, in, as you know, very well in the process of selling the yacht, you get a lot of curve balls yes. coming in and irrespective of whether it's 90 feet or 90 meters, sometimes you just need to run the situation past another broker to, to see what they think. Yep. Um, <laughs> Dylan, Dylan Zero says, is selling a bigger yacht more fun than the smaller ones? Ah, uh, it depends. I mean, the, every deal is different. You know, there's, every client is different. You know, some of my favorite deals have been smaller boats and, you know, some clients that we work with are, you know, just so great to be with. And, you know, I think it just depends, yeah. you know? Yeah, it's more about the people in the boat, isn't it? That makes yeah. it fun or, or not fun sometimes. <laughs> Um, what's, uh, this is a question from me for people watching, cause a lot of people who watch this YouTube channel would love to get into the industry. Uh, would love to become a broker. And, and that's really got nothing to do with the fact as to whether you're male or female, cause you're mm -hmm. just a successful broker. So what would your advice be for people wanting to get into the industry? Into the, like, uh, any, in any way, like in any way at all, I would say, you know, I, I do get, you know, people will approach me and say, Hey, can you get me a job? And I'm like, no, I can't get anybody a job. I'd say when I got into the industry, I didn't know anybody. I, you know, went down to 17th Street, looked for a crew house. Yeah. And then I knocked on all the doors of, you know, the crew agents and just made it happen. You know, I would say just take take the rain by the, or the horns, how do you say it? Horns, <laughs> horns by the rain. Horns by the rain. <laughs> <laughs> and just, you know, go make it happen for yourself. Don't wait for somebody to help you and you know, maybe have a, a few discussions with people about it because maybe you'll learn that it's not for you. Um, but, you know, go online, look look it up and look up different companies. You know, Northrop and Johnson, we have crew placement here. We have, you know, you can learn about uh, positions here, sales brokers, charter brokers, marketing, yeah. whatever, you know, you're interested in. But, you know, just do some research and, and don't rely on somebody to help you. You know, I, I do get that a lot. You know, people will call me and say, hey, my son wants to, to get into the industry, can he? Can you take him to lunch and then can you find him a job? And I, I can't. Well, the same sort of mentality is true when a, a young broker wants to come to a big brokerage house and they say, but will I get lots of inquiries given to me? Yeah. It's the same kind of thing. You, you have to make your own inquiries, really. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a, a, huge, a huge part of it is, you know, waking up and, you know, going after it yourself. You know, yeah. you have to make it happen and, you know, it's, you're only going to be as successful as, as hard as you work. Yeah. So. When, when I was um, working more in the Antibes office, uh, I was interviewing quite a few young brokers. And for me, when they asked that question, when they said, yeah, but how many inquiries are you going to give me? That was like a, yeah. that was a sign that maybe they weren't the right person to be working with us. Because yeah. sure, we get inquiries from the website and from the yeah. YouTube channel, but you've got to be dynamic and go out there and get them, yeah. get the business. Um, Rudy again asks, does it take luck or hard work to become a successful broker? I would say both, you know, I would definitely say both, you know, it's relationships, it's who you know, you know, it is hard work, it is, you know, what what you know, what you're going to offer your clients, but it's a combination for sure. You know, if you're in the right place at the right time, you, you that ha it happens. I got lucky a few times, you know, you, you go to boat shows, not everybody goes to and you know, you walk on board a boat and you just start chatting and all of a sudden you're discussing things that are not related to the boat, you know, family, their activities, what they like. And then lo and behold, a week later, they'll call you, call you and say, Hey, my boss wants to sell the boat. Can you put a proposal together? So, you know, things like that just happen. Yeah. But you have to be there at the show. Yeah. You have, you have to be there, but yeah. you know, it's definitely a combination. Yeah. Great answer. Um, Braveheart Tudor says, do you see younger families with smaller children getting into yachting? Um, sure, I, I do. I mean, it's, you know, I would say that the, the buyers are getting younger, you know, and they are looking to, you know, enjoy time with their families on the boats. Uh, I would say, you know, my, because I do hear charter, I would say a lot of families are chartering as well. And, you know, I would say the age is definitely decreasing and yeah. <laughs> so they do have younger children 
Yes, it's a it's a great thing to do with the family. I, I I had one client who got out of yachting for a couple of years because he got a newborn and he just was a little bit concerned about taking a newborn born onto a onto a yacht. And then he got back into it as the kids grew up. Yeah. And still a yacht owner now. Um Dylan Zero just makes the observation that he'd rather own a yacht than be the broker. I think we all would rather <laughs> that. <laughs> Um, barely afloat with Steve. That must be a really interesting YouTube channel. Barely afloat with Steve says, you go girl. I have three daughters and love seeing success stories for women and the possibilities that might be afforded to them. Yeah, well, good. Maria Levasheva. That's a very familiar name to me. It says, hi, David. Could you please save this stream? I'm late, but I'd like to watch it later. Sure, Maria. As a matter of fact, it's um, it's pretty much automatic. When the live stream finishes, um, the whole video remains on YouTube. I think I think it takes maybe a couple of hours for it to process, but certainly um, within three or four hours, you should be able to watch the whole thing from the beginning. I think I remember your name. I think you have a yachting company called Sailing with Noah or Noah Sailing in Croatia. Let me know if I'm right. Gregory Ward says, has the sales rush that occurred during peak COVID waned at this point? Not yet. I would say not yet for us. I, people are still, there's still contracts going out and yeah. boats are still disappearing quickly. You know, if it's, if it's the right price and the right location and it's, you know, maintained well, it's, it's pretty much going to be sold yeah. within 30, 60 days. As a matter of fact, as we speak in this office here, in that room there, Whit Kirtland is um, closing the sale yeah. of a yacht, getting the bill of sale signed and getting all the final documentation done. So, I mean, the, the industry is still... Yeah, booming. Booming. Long may it last. Um, he also has a follow-up question. He says, what about prices? It seems prices of boats surged during COVID. Have they stayed up there or are they declining? I would say that they are still up there mm. for sure. Yeah. And people are paying, you know. I think people are putting a value on, you know, the time that they're going to enjoy on the boat and that's more important to them right now. Yeah. Great answer. Um, Dylan Zero says, I can't wait to contact you guys soon. Make sure that you contact Kristen when the time comes, Dylan. Rudy says, it's great chance for me who speaks so little English. I can watch it many times. Ah, that's talking about the uh, recording of the live stream. Dylan Zero says, people who charter yachts, do they often move on to buy one later on? Oftentimes, yes, they do. I've done a few deals with, you know, clients that had chartered for 10 years and they bought a boat during the pandemic. So, yeah, I would say that a lot of charter clients eventually you know, end up owning a boat. For sure. do, do you ever do charter yourself? Do you, do I, I have never done a charter. My, my, my sister, I have a twin that works here, Jessica Engelman excellent charter broker <laughs> but she's the charter girl so she does yeah. her thing and if i have clients that want a charter i put them put them to her yes yeah, so that's a pretty good yes yeah, so chris has a, a twin sister called jess jessica jess, jess singleman yeah. and uh and for all of your charter needs jess is the person to talk to <laughs> uh she's also in this office and also going to the naples office we have a, yep. an office in naples yep. too as well here um and Cytec. Hi to both of you. I heard a few years ago that this industry was relatively patriarchal. Do you find that things have changed? I would say that I've definitely seen some change. You know, there's a few more female brokers out there. I know here at Northrop and Johnson, I mean, there's, I think that 55% of our workforce is females. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think there's a change. And again, I don't, that's, it doesn't bother me when, you know, there's more men out there and, you know, than females. My my colleagues all say, oh, come on, Kristen, you're one of the one of the guys now. Just come along, you know. Yeah. So I don't I don't really see it as a, you know, something to think about anyways. And, and we're a fairly young company as well. I mean, um, you know, the, the CEO, Daniel's a fairly young guy, uh, fairly dynamic. And it, it amazes me that, um, for example, social media, how slow some of the older brokerage houses were to embrace that. And we were one of the first to really go for it in a big way. I mean, the, the tie up with the YouTube channel at a time when certain other brokerage companies, which will remain unnamed, were still sort of scoffing that approach, but it's proven to be very effective. Uh, we're getting loads of questions coming in. Um, 
83 d Postel says, do you see many new yacht owners jump right into a large yacht or do they normally upgrade after they decide that they like it? I would say I've seen both. I would say the, you know, the smarter thing to do, I think, would be to start smaller and then gradually move up. And, you know, maybe you, you like it, but you want more space or maybe you, you're not comfortable with a lot of crew on board. You'd rather have less. You know, so you stay in a certain size range. But I've sold boats to people that have never owned a boat before. You know, that was over, yeah. you know, 140 feet. Yeah. So it ha it both. You know, you see both. Where would you recommend starting size wise to sort of dip your feet in the water? I would say, you know, for somebody that is looking to cruise in the Bahamas, New England, I would say probably 112, 120 feet would be a nice yeah. size. Um, it's a comfortable. You know, you have, uh, you know, four staterooms at least, you know, yeah. you're cruising at 10, 12 knots, you know, you have a salon. And Not too many crew. No, you'd have maybe yeah. four or five crew. Yeah. Um, so I would say that size range is a good, but there's so many other things that go into it as well. But... And would you recommend for a first time buyer to buy new or used? That's also, you know, going to be dependent on what they're looking for. Some people are just, you know, I want a brand new boat. I don't want to have to think about it. I want warranties. You know, when I'm done with it, I want to know that it will sell relatively quickly for, you know, close to maybe what I purchased it for. And then, you know, other clients are just, you know, going to be different and it just depends. Yeah. So it's a question of listening to the client really as you say, and, and see what they want. Um, loads more. Oh, Maria, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Levashev. Levashev. It can't be that difficult. No, Levashev. Thank you. Yes, I have a sailing charter company, Noah Sailing in Italy, Sardinia, and I'm very interested in brokerage as well. Um, Sardinia. Have you been to Sardinia? I have not. Oh, beautiful place, beautiful place. And I'll tell you what, Maria, feel free to put your website in the comments so that if people want to uh, go sailing in Sardinia, they can, they can contact you. Uh, Valeria Ann says there are water desalinators for yachts that produce... <laughs> this is not off the cuff... <laughs> Unexpected comment. There are water desalinators for yachts that produce electricity. Combined with solar panels, wind generators, and water movement generators could greatly reduce fuel costs. <laughs> Do you or Max know of any? What about, what about me and Kristen? Do me and Kristen know of any? <laughs> have, you, have you heard about this? I um, have not. No, this is a new one to me as well. Uh, SciTech says, thanks for the answer. Um, Dylan Zero says, unfortunately, I have to go, but I'll continue watching later. Thanks for joining us, Dylan. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Valeria Ann says, by the way, thanks for doing this talk and question and answers about becoming a yacht broker. Braveheart Tudor says, this question is for both of you. I understand you can hire a crew through a management company. But I was watching the Heaston show. You know, Heaston do a regular mm -hmm. um, show on YouTube. Uh, and they were talking about a college for yacht crew, high-level training. Can you both expand on this? So what, what do you know, first of all, about hiring crew? I mean, I would say, yes, you can hire a crew through a management company and you don't have to deal with it. You know, I've heard, I've seen management companies send owners once a month, you know, a crew list with resumes, any changes to their certifications. You know, if you have to hire a new crew, they'll give you options. But yes, you can do that. I haven't heard of this school no, high level training. I mean, there's training, but that's that can be done at a number of different places, can't it? Uh, yeah, crew training. I, I've seen that there are some um, some companies that specialize, for example, in uh, training for purses or training for chief stews mm -hmm. and, and you know, silver service, that kind of thing. But the other great thing with the management company, I think, as well, is that if if you own a yacht with a crew, it's got a pleasure. It's got to be a pleasure and if the point comes when you need to fire one of the crew mm -hmm. it's a much easier call to make to the management company yeah. Yeah. than it is to have to do yourself yeah and that's and you're having a management company it really allows an owner to boat yeah you know a lot of reasons you know one of the main reasons owner crew headaches of you know, i don't want to know all the board or you know, yeah. I, I, they don't want to know. They just want to show up, enjoy the boat, you know, and they do want to see similar faces, you know, time and time again, but yeah. they just don't want to have to deal with all the, you know, behind the scenes work. Yeah. It's a difficult compromise to make because I get that um, 
you want to be friendly with the crew, of course. And that's especially the case in the States where you see almost the crew area and the owner's area yeah. merging in a country kitchen scenario. But my observation has been that when the owner of the yacht becomes very friendly with the crew, then the crew will go directly to the owner for a pay rise rather than go through the captain, which mm. is the appropriate way of doing it. And so sometimes it can backfire massively by you know, making the crew your best mates. There's still yeah. got to be that boss worker relationship, which I guess a management company can assist with. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Valerie Hans says, Max is the engineer type, right? Are you an engineer type, Max? <laughs> I do everything. <laughs> he says he does everything. <laughs> uh, she says, I very much appreciate the question and answer. Thank you very much. I think the questions have pretty much come to an end now, actually. So that was amazing and okay. <laughs> brilliant. Um, try and think of a good last question to throw to you. What, what's your day looking like today? What's uh... Uh, well, I'm actually about to drive to Miami and have lunch with uh, some of uh, the folks over at the International Seakeeper Society. Tell um, me about that. What's the Seakeeper Society? Uh, so they're, an, uh, an, a I don't even know if they're a charity or an organization, but they they help put uh, scientists together with boat owners uh, to do their research. And I don't know why they invited me to lunch. So I said, okay, I'd love to come down, but I do support their mission of, you know, you know, they do beach cleanups. They, you know, educate down in Miami uh, with school groups and things like that. And they do boat donations. So I'm going to head down there and then come back here and, you know, plug away in the office. <laughs> and typically speaking, a typical day, how do you go about sort of, if, at the moment, I guess you've got so much business going on that it just has its own momentum. But if you find yourself at a moment when you've got no pressing deals, how do you go about getting new business? Uh, that's a great question. So I would say I, you know, I do have a schedule in the morning. I get up, I have a dog that wakes me up at 6.30 in the morning. And, uh, you know, you just get up and go to the office. And I, tr I try to do flyers, you know, you send them to your database, you know, see who's looking at your fly, anything, uh, you know, go look at boats, walk the docks, you know, just try to, you know, come up with a, a strategy of finding new business. Yep. Well, Kristen, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank everybody for watching and, and for joining in. I didn't actually look at how many people uh, there were, but uh, oh, there's actually currently 40 people, 41 people watching and generally speaking these videos go on to get a couple of thousand three thousand views okay. so i hope that brings you some business as well <laughs> and i hope it was inspirational for people who want to get to the industry so thank you very much everybody for watching thank you and that's it